All right, so again, we're in the midst of a trade war, but it didn't begin with President Trump. I just gave you my take on 178 years of, of ambition by China to reclaim what was theirs. Let's go to the panel now to discuss. Michael Pillsbury, Hudson Institute Chinese Strategy Director, former Trump transition team foreign policy advisor and also author of the 100-year marathon, Fox Business correspondent Susan Lee. Gordon Chang is back with us as well. Uh, let me start with you, um, Gordon. Uh, you heard my spiel, my, my little uh, walk through history, if you will. Uh, you know, to me, it just seems that uh, American economists, particularly conservative economists, are okay with so-called free trade. We send out our, our precious money, our, uh, and it comes back into our country in the form of ownership of our bonds or our companies. Uh, and I think we're, it's all slipping away from this country. Yeah, well, it certainly is. You know, you have a lot of economists who say, well, look, your trade balance is not a good indication of your trade relationship. But the point is, those countries that have surpluses are able to accumulate cash and then use them to accomplish national purposes. And, and that's exactly what the United States did in an earlier era. That's what the Chinese are doing now. They're building, for instance, a Navy and Air Force, which is configured to fight the U.S. And so we've got to rethink this, because this is not just a trade issue, Charles. This is also going to be national security, because we're seeing this all the time as China's military grows larger and larger. Susan? Well, I take a look at it from an academic perspective because I studied economics in university. And there was a, a famous economist named Ricardo who coined the term about comparative advantage. If one country can make it cheaper and better, well, then I guess the uh, the the winds of e economics means that they can make it and sell it, sell more. And that's kind of what's <laughs> happening right now. Right. Uh, and, and let me ask you, Michael, because I think consumerism uh, certainly, uh, you know, could, could be part of the ultimate downfall of America. You know, I applaud the Chinese. Uh, when they weren't making that much money, they had a 50 percent savings rate, which enabled them to propel themselves to this position. But you've studied this very well. You've written a book about it. What are your thoughts? Well, I think your 200-year history is exactly correct. And you might be surprised to know that's how China sees the last 200 years as well. Uh, a lot of what been, they've been talking about under this sort of the slogan of the China dream is rejuvenation back to the period you're talking about. And they think they made a lot of progress last week when the American delegation came to Beijing. I think you know this, Charles. Uh, the Chinese were given the advanced American position, the so-called eight points, and they leaked it to the Chinese public uh, on a social media website for a while. And they've been talking about how this is a new boxer expedition, this is a new opium war, you know, how dare the Americans make these outrageous demands just in the last few days. This is the main uh, newspaper story in China, how outrageous President Trump's demands are. So your historical lesson really applies to last week and perhaps even to next week, the next few days, when the Chinese delegation comes here and President Trump expects them to give their at least their initial reply. Right. It's probably going to be no to all eight points. Wow. What would happen if that was the case, Gordon? Well, I think, think that we're going to see, you know, more and more trade friction, as indeed we should, because the United States needs to protect itself. You know, we see China going after innovation, American innovation. That's the core of our mm -hmm. economy. If we don't have innovation, we don't have an economy I to agree. speak of. So that's really important. And I do agree, Ricardo's important, yeah. comparative advantage, but the Chinese are not really big believers in that, as they are trying <laughs> to, with their Made in China 2025 initiative, basically crowd everybody else out. And especially through their mercantilist and predatory practices, they are trying to rewrite the laws of economics. Long term, it might not make sense, but in the short term, it's really, really dangerous to us. Well, they're doing the, uh, they're doing the new Silk Road, putting $150 billion a year into that. Last year, they began building a new uh, com uh, computer complex, $11 billion, $12 billion. And, and this is where I'm co really concerned, one of the areas, because their next leap in quantum computing mm -hmm. could put us at such a disadvantage. They already have the world's two fastest supercomputers by a million miles, right, or, 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 or hundreds of petaflops, right? The next generation of this, I think, Susan, is going to put us not only at an economic disadvantage, but right. a military disadvantage. Well, they have a centralized economy, meaning that the government can turn on the taps to any sector they want, and that is the focus right now on technology. And when they ascended to the WTO in 2001 for foreign companies to work and operate and sell in China, well, you had to pair up with the Chinese company. And in that uh, cooperation or that 
partnership, they had to transfer a lot of technology. So the Chinese have learned a lot throughout the year, 16 years, and now technology is a focus. They want to own it. They want to advance it. And AI is their focus. And apparently, they're making huge strides, probably even beyond what the U.S. is doing right now. You know, Michael, uh, just two weeks ago, in fact, uh, they forced Arm Holdings, which is uh, one of the world's top semiconductor companies. It was bought by SoftBank for $33 billion into a joint venture with a Chinese partner that took 51 percent. To Susan's point, they're going to use that to gain all of the technology prowls there. And, you know, I, I, my concern is if we don't fight back now, I think the clock is ticking and we'll never have an opportunity to fight back. Well, the other theme the Chinese have been pushing the last couple of weeks is that their desire to fight back, that they've learned a lesson from what the Americans did in their negotiations with Japan uh, under President Reagan, when actually it's a coincidence in some ways, the deputy trade representative then was Bob Lighthizer, who's been promoted by President Trump. He's in charge of our trade policy. And here he is in Beijing. Chinese have been saying he wants to disable or block China's growth the same way he did with Japan in those negotiations. And I think there's some, some accuracy in the Chinese case. The American position is really very tough. But now we're in the next round where the Chinese may just say no to everything. That's what I'm right. most worried about, Charles. We'll see. I mean, uh, the stakes are high. This could be the biggest high stakes game, or if, if it's not a game, but certainly an engagement that America faces this year. The world is watching. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate uh, the economics lesson and a walk through history.